Well, today's topic, dimensional gates, we are going to see this first part only, and you will see that this is a truly impressive topic. I truly believe it will be something that will shock many people of the Christian world, because I think that we are going to discover a series of things that we many times, or practically never, have believed as were to be something true. Inside the esoteric world, the dimensional doors are very much talked about. What are the dimensional doors? Well, it is talked about that there are certain areas that are like tunnels in space. Tunnels in which if someone enters one of these tunnels, he would come out very quickly from the other side, exceeding impressive speeds, and that would bring closer to very distant points in the universe in practically one moment. Of course, this said like that sounds very much like science fiction, doesn't it? But in the esoteric world, these beliefs are very common, and also for people in the UFO area, etc. They talk about the Bermuda Triangle, as if it could be a dimensional door to another place, etc. Now, today what we're going to see at first is going to be the first part of a documentary that precisely lasts about two hours, but don't worry, we're not going to see the whole two hours of it. We will only play about 45 minutes, and you're going to see that in these first 45 minutes approximately, some things are said that are going to surprise you very much. You know, this documentary is starting to be nearly a, like a cult for many people that are in more esoteric affairs, not Christian. You will see that the narrator, the, the presenter, along with his wife, they present themselves as precisely belonging or, or were belonging to a company that their families were Procter and Gamble. Do they ring a bell? And I would like to tell you that this company precisely was denounced by people that were in more or less religious areas because in their emblem you could see like a man with a beard and the aspect of this face was like the number 666. They said publicly that this company was in some strange things. Well, it turns out that precisely them, they say, you'll see it now, that they are left out of their family afterwards, and you'll see that practically everything starts with certain visions that this man had when he was young, going on a bus, I don't know if it was going to school, and he has a vision of something which practically everything on the documentary is based on. With this, I would like to tell you that you must keep in mind that some great discoverments and great inventions have not been just like that. And we have already seen it in previous conferences that there have been people that have had like a series of revelations of dreams, of someone that has talked to them, that has imbued them a certain thought. And from that point, they have managed to discover something. Keep this in mind because we have already seen with the topic of Lucifer and other things that we have been presenting, how Satan has the capacity to transmit knowledge to humans so that they later can do or say things because they have been originated by a satanic thought. This does not have to mean that everything that they say is a lie. Far from it. You know, I would like to tell you the experience of how this has worked. To center you a bit on the topic, I personally, until a few months ago, did not believe at all in dimensional doors. Not at all. I always saw it as the esoteric world, as something quite incredible, because Christianly this has never been talked about. But you know, I might have needed some time of giving conferences in which I have been able to find out how Satan 
always plagiarizes, not inventes, plagiarizes what is from God. And then he simply gives it a slight touch to turn it around just a few degrees, to take things to his world, to what he wants. So, he proposes something very true, and finally, the objective is to turn it to somewhere else. We have seen it in many things. Well, maybe I needed this period of learning, thanks to the conferences also, so that suddenly I could feel in my inside, don't ask me how, that I needed to deal with this topic, that there was something that was true. And you know, prayer works. And thanks to God, I think I have managed to prepare things that I believe are going to open your mind in a very impressive manner. You will see that after dealing with this matter, many biblical texts and many references that appear in the Bible and some quotes of Ellen White are going to open you to a completely different panorama to the content of certain texts that are going to transmit a strength that the text until now had not transmitted. I'm saying this from a personal experience. Maybe you could say, well, this guy's hallucinating or something like that. But you will see that through these two or three conferences, I don't know how many are going to be needed, we will precisely comprehend that this is no nonsense. Um, there are people that talk about black holes in space, that they say they even allow to go back in time or go into future. Well, this is another story. This um, is another story that is not what we are talking about now. Of what we are talking about is wormholes that would allow to be transferred from one place to another at an incredible speed and that we will continue to see how there are or not an interconnection between one concrete point on planet Earth and a totally distant point very far from here and it is not the only one but well all of that we will show it successively and you will know how to see how precisely Ron Wyatt already said something that was registered and we passed it on here on a resume and at the end of today's conference to finish we will remember this again because it will serve us precisely to link it with the next topic in a way that I think it is very worth you not to miss it. Well, then, before anything, we are going to enter with a text, a quote of Ellen White that is found in the book The Desired of Ages, a book that precisely narrates the experiences of Jesus with very impressive details. Before we talked about what would be a false prophet with the lady Catherine Emmerich, that we saw her apparitions, the visions that which she had, etc., etc., who approached her to tell her these things. Well, you're going to see that God's prophets sometimes say things very similar to what Satan reveals to his minions, to these people that without knowing they are following him and obeying him. But you will see that there is a series of differences between what one and the others write. Above all, it is the final objective. Nonetheless, today we are not going to talk about Jesus' life in here, but we are going to see only an extraction of quotes, uh, two pages, to center ourselves in the topic that we are going to be fully immersed now. I have marked it in blue, as you can see. Well, I have not done it. it, it was my daughter that did it. It says to us, this is page 142, paragraph 3 of Desired of Ages. At thought of the precious blessings he had brought to men, Jesus added, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God 
ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. These words don't say anything to you. Heaven open and angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. We will have time to break down all of this, but that will be in the second part of this topic. Here, Christ virtually says, on the bank of the Jordan, the heavens were opened and the Spirit descended like a dove upon me. That scene was but a token that I am the Son of God. If you believe on me as such, your faith shall be quickened. You shall see that the heavens are opened and are never to be closed. I have opened them to you. The angels of God are ascending, bearing the prayers of the needy and distressed to the Father above, and descending, bringing blessing and hope, courage, help and life to the children of men. The angels of God are ever passing from earth to heaven, and from heaven to earth. The miracles of Christ for the afflicted and suffering were wrought by the power of God through the ministration of the angels. And it is through Christ, by the ministration of his heavenly messengers, that every blessing comes from God to us. In taking upon himself humanity, our Saviour unites his interests with those of the fallen sons and daughters of Adam, while through his divinity he grasps the throne of God, and thus Christ is the medium of communication of men with God and of God with men. I don't know if you have managed to perceive any importance magnitude in these words. When we read for so many times, for so many years, these words and these biblical texts that they are referring to, we do not manage to imagine what they really, literally are talking about. So many times we grab things with a spiritual significance and we throw away the literal. Well, you can see how God's angels move from above to below and below to above. And Christ did something, the intercession, the bridge, the doorway between God and men, and men to God. There is a certain symbolism, isn't there? But there is also a literality. Well, I am not going to go further on on this matter. This is just to start to know what we are going to deal with here and what is going to surprise us so much. And now, without more delay, we are going to start to see these approximately 45 minutes of this video documentary that you have here. I would like to say that you must pay much attention to the images that are going to be appear created by computers of how a certain type of energies work on Earth and probably further on because I would like you to see the shapes, the forms. It is very interesting to be able to comprehend how everything that we are going to talk about afterwards works. Uh, you will see that he has an interview with a man that is very recognized in what seems to be the, the NASA even and on a scientific level, Nassim Haramein, of which many people more linked to the esoteric world, much less to Christian world, have him as a celebrity. It seems he is a very intelligent person, but he talks about very interesting things, but he does not take people afterwards to Christ, of course, far from it. As also this documentary does not take people to Christ as it goes to an end. Uh, it says very pretty things. It talks to us about how the world is going to change and be an amazing kindness paradigm, etc., etc. All of this is a lie. These are the satanic deceptions. It is the millennium of peace that the world is hoping for, but that is not 
is what is going to happen. Satan will manage to have this for a short period of time and the world is going to fall on their knees to this deception when he will appear as if he were Christ. But it does not finish there. That is why it is interesting what the Apostle Paul said, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, because sometimes there are things that we can extract that are truly worth to know, but we must know how to reject what is truly an error. Keep very attentive, above all, to the images that you are going to see in those images that are created and the explanations that they give. Let's begin the video. system on our beloved planet is an eloquent expression of the universe's astonishing ability to come into perfect balance and then to do what life is meant to do to thrive thriving is the natural flow of life Consider what is surely one of the greatest wonders of all, how a tiny egg and a single irrepressibly plucky sperm can unleash a process that brings forth in the end another one of us, a being of vast ability and unlimited potential, with a brain capable of complex and soaring self-reflection, legs made to dance and run, fingers nimble enough to weave a basket play a violin, caress a face. If nature teaches us anything, it is that life is meant to work, and that like every living thing, our purpose is to thrive. And yet, for the majority of people on the planet, life is not about thriving. It's about surviving, just trying to hang on. Is this really the best we can do? Did the universe labor for nearly 14 billion years only to bring forth a species that would end up as an enemy to life itself and to its own home? I don't think so. My name is Foster Gamble, and I have spent nearly a lifetime trying to figure out what happened. What is happening that could account for the staggering agony and deprivation on this planet? As a young man, Driven by the misery I saw and by my fear for our survival, I set out on a journey, seeking to answer questions like, 
Is it even possible for humans to thrive? If so, why aren't we? My research led me to places I never expected to go, revealing surprising discoveries that seemed unrelated at first, but which turned out to be crucially connected, as you'll see. I found a code, a pattern in nature that's been embedded in arts and icons throughout the centuries. I believe this code holds the key to a new source of clean, sustainable energy that could completely revolutionize the way all people live. I came to understand how our economic system is rigged, and I found out what we can do about it. My journey revealed ways we can claim our power to create liberating, healthy systems everywhere on Earth. I have realized that we are not a mistake. We are simply mistaken. We've been blinded to our brilliance, shorn of our strength, ignorant of our genius, unaware of our true power and magnificence. But all that is about to change. I invite you to share with me the highlights of my unlikely journey. I've created this navigator to take us through time and space. Let me show you around. On this screen, we can access what I call our vitals. It's the critical data we don't get from the corporate media, which in the US has consolidated from 50 companies down to five in just over 25 years. We'll use this to check on how we're really doing. The right screen tracks how to chart a healthy, sustainable course for living on planet Earth. I call these the navigating insights. And this will be our compass. Instead of a needle seeking north in our Earth's magnetic field, our compass is the shape of the field itself. And that shape, as you will soon see, has amazing technological and social ramifications. After a lifetime quest, I've come to believe that this pattern actually holds the key to a world that works for everyone. So let's go. I grew up in a world of privilege and power, attending elite private schools and then Princeton University. As a direct descendant of one of the founders of Procter & Gamble, I was groomed to be a leader in the establishment, but I chose a different path. I began to wake up when I was in elementary school. Adults were teaching me that the way to protect myself from a nuclear explosion was to duck under my desk and cover my head. That's when my serious questioning began. A couple of years later, I had a direct experience of universal energy. It happened one day when I was riding on a school bus, gazing out the window. I had a vision of a whirlpool pattern and I just knew that the flow of energy I was seeing was the same in an atom as in our entire solar system. I felt deeply that I too was somehow made of that same pattern. This vision was what originally got me into science, into trying to figure out how the universe works and how we humans fit into the overall pattern of life energy. Years later, I learned that the pattern I saw is known by some in the scientific world. It turns out that in 1921, Albert Einstein got a Nobel Prize for discovering that when energy is released in the universe, there are little packets of wholeness that emerge. 
This pattern actually tells us a lot about how life evolves. Considering the enduring wonders of creation throughout the universe, and how unsustainable so many of our human systems are, I figured learning how the universe creates and sustains life would actually be quite useful. Each of these little packets of wholeness that Einstein discovered, called a quantum, is made out of its surroundings, but is distinct within it, like a whirlpool in water. These packets are always the same pattern, no matter what size, and they are surprisingly relevant to issues as seemingly disconnected as the wars in the Middle East, the global financial collapse, and how to achieve justice for everyone. We're about to explore how. Mathematicians call this pattern the torus. The energy in a torus flows in through one end, circulates around the center, and exits out the other side. It's balanced, self-regulating, and always whole. I was first officially introduced to the torus by scientist and inventor Arthur Young. Futurist Dwayne Elgin explains how the torus is the primary pattern that nature uses for life at every scale. Evolution means to, uh, to unfold, to roll out. So the question is, what is the universe rolling out? And what the universe is rolling out is self-organizing systems. And you can see this at every scale. A self-organizing system is a technical term for just uh, a system getting a hold of itself, uh, knowing itself, essentially. And uh, if we go to nature, uh, we, can, we can look at and we can see the self-organizing forms uh, throughout. We can see it in, in the cross-section of an orange, the cross-section uh, of an apple. We can see it uh, in the dynamic nature of a tornado. Uh, we can see it in the um, magnetic field around the Earth, a similar magnetic field around a, uh, an individual. We can see it in the structure of an entire whirlpool galaxy. Uh, we can see it in the structure uh, of, a, of a small atom. Uh, at every scale throughout its entire history, the universe has one single project. It's growing toruses. The universe is a torus growing factory. These toroidal dynamics are visible at various scales. One of them is at the galactic level, which are huge spinning structures with billions of stars in it. Looks like typically big arms of galaxies spinning around, and they have vortices that goes from the center out to the edge of the galactic halo that surrounds them. Stars move from this galactic disk out to the halo, down the vortices, and back out again. Stars like Arcturus, for instance, we know have done that path already. That's the appropriate description even for the atmosphere of our planet. The weather goes from the North Pole down to the equator and then back up, from the South Pole up to the equator and then back down. Even the dynamics on the surface of the Sun are very similar. Of course, here we're looking at it from an external perspective on a small-scale model. When you look at the solar system embedded in the galaxy, embedded in the cluster, embedded in the supercluster, we're traveling in this boundless sea of infinite Taurus flow. The Taurus is like the breath of the universe. It's the form that the flow of energy takes at every scale of existence. But there's also an underlying structure in how the flow fits together, sort of like a skeleton. It's called the vector equilibrium, a term coined by one of the 20th century's greatest thinkers, Buckminster Fuller. 
Inspired by Fuller's visionary work, I spent decades researching the dynamics of the vector equilibrium and the torus. I became so excited by the potential of the toroidal energy form that in 1997, I co-founded a multidisciplinary think tank called the Sequoia Symposium to study the pattern and explore its applications. Our collected research convinced me that the torus and the vector equilibrium are primary patterns, fundamental to the creation of the universe at all scales. At the Sequoia Symposium gatherings, I learned of inventors who claimed they were using the torus dynamic as the basis for devices that generated energy without combustion. This revolutionary development, accessing what's sometimes called zero point or radiant or free energy, is now being called most simply new energy technology. Given that so much of the suffering in our world is the result of lack of access to energy, I realized that free, unlimited, clean energy would be one of the greatest breakthroughs in history. It could not just improve, but actually transform the quality of life on this planet. So I began to wonder who else knew about this pattern or about this powerful potential energy source. Some of the scientists at this symposium showed me how the Taurus has been encoded by different cultures for millennia. Apparently, ancient cultures had embedded this code in the most enduring forms then possible, in stories, in icons, in alphabets, and buildings. Here we are at one of the world's oldest sacred sites, the Osirian Temple at Abydos, Egypt. Very little writing is found in the Osirian Temple. However, there is one very significant piece of information in that temple. It is a very faint, but clear and precise drawing. It's not etched into the rock. It's not carved. It's burnt into the atomic structure of the rock in some extraordinary way. Nassim has decoded the Osirian symbol in three dimensions. Since our world is not two-dimensional, it makes sense that codes relaying information about our world also wouldn't be limited to flat designs. His three-dimensional version of the Osirian symbol starts with the vector equilibrium, a perfectly balanced force field with 12 equal energy lines radiating out. They stabilize its center like the 12 spokes of a wheel. The primary pattern of balanced energy flow around this structure is the torus. Here we expand to the next larger scale with a total of 64 pyramids called tetrahedra. If we then put spheres in representing the toroidal energy field surrounding each of the pyramids, and then we drop away the pyramids, we end up with a matrix that is, amazingly, an exact overlay for the Osirian icon, a three-dimensional model of the same pattern that was burned into the rock wall of the Egyptian temple thousands of years ago. Now we travel across continents, from Egypt to China, where the same geometry appears at another sacred site built in 1420. Then you go to the Forbidden City, where the sun gods reside, and where you find at the entrance the Fu Dogs, the guardians of the knowledge. They guard the knowledge under their paw. The same geometry of 64 energy units is encoded again. I started wondering, is it just a coincidence that the exact same design appears in significant places on two different continents? But then Nassim showed me that this geometry of 64 is encoded time and again in cultures across the centuries and from all over the world. The Hebrew Kabbalistic Tree of Life creates the same structure we just saw with the vector equilibrium again embedded at every level. The ancient Chinese system of wisdom called the I Ching 
is based on 64 hexagrams, symbols with six lines in a set, some continuous, some broken. These can be put together as the six edges of a tetrahedron and together would form the 64 tetrahedron crystal. This same pattern shows up in modern scientific research. The double helix has an alphabet of 64 codons that are used to encode our human DNA. I had seen that there was advanced knowledge of the living geometry of the universe thousands of years ago, but how on earth did they know about it? Most of the stories of ancient Egypt and Mayan and Incas talk about sun gods coming to the earth and teaching them uh, engineering and writing and all of their science. I started to wonder if all these sun gods were not advanced civilization coming from another part of our galaxy. These texts and many ancient culture describe them as coming in flying boats or in the Vedic tradition, flying machines and so on. There is many mention of these sun gods coming through time. Could these early pilots from beyond our world be the ones responsible for sharing the knowledge of this code? Could they actually be tapping its power to propel themselves through the cosmos? This isn't where I thought my research would lead me, and these notions were rocking my world. But Nassim has impressive evidence to back up his theories and I could see no other rational way advanced math and physics concepts would have been recorded over 3,000 years ago. I sought out one of the most knowledgeable investigators, Dr. Stephen Greer, the founder of the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. He's conducted hundreds of interviews with top-ranking government and military witnesses. And so when we talk about extraterrestrial intelligence, we're talking about uh, civilizations that have reach the point of, of being sentient like we are, but whose technologies and perhaps social capabilities are such that they've been able to become interstellar or interplanetary civilizations. And when you look at the fact that the most conservative estimates are in the Milky Way galaxy, that there are at least 10,000 Earth-like planets that have intelligent life on them, and that at least half of them are likely to be as advanced or more than ours. It's almost a certainty that there's intelligent life out there that have mastered uh, the laws of the universe beyond what's currently taught at MIT and Caltech to be able to transfer through space-time in real time through vast distances of interstellar space. We have over 4,000 cases where these objects have landed on terra firma and left physical evidence. We have over 3,500 pilot cases. We have hundreds of cases, including ones from the highest ranking investigator at the FAA, John Callahan, and numerous other operators where these objects have been tracked on radar, going tens of thousands of miles per hour or dematerializing and then reappearing in another point in the sky. Yes, there have been ET visitation. There have been crashed craft. There have been uh, uh, material and bodies recovered. We have contact with aliens not originating from some foreign country, but from some other solar system. And I have been a party to that. There were documents that I have seen that refer to the Roosevelt uh, having several instances of uh, UFO flyovers, and particularly after they took on board uh, nuclear weapons. And my SEAL told me, Jordan, this, you know, what have you got in your log? This never happened. The crew going on duty and the crew coming off duty all saw the UFO just hovering in midair. It was a metallic circular object and uh, from what I understand the missiles were all shut down. That means they went dead 
and something turned those missiles off. Now, remember, all this stuff is flying at several thousand miles an hour. So this thing fires a beam of light at the warhead, hits it, and then this thing flies up like this. Meanwhile, we're all going like this, fires another beam of light, goes around like this, we're going like this, fires another beam of light, goes down like this, fires another beam of light, and then flies out the way it came in. And the warhead tumbles out of the outer space. The feeling at the time was that it must have been extraterrestrial. They took the film and they spooled off the part that had the UFO on it and they took a pair of scissors and cut it off. They put that on a separate reel, they put it in their briefcase, they handed Major Mansman back the rest of the film and said, here, I don't need to remind you, Major Mansman, of, this, of the uh, severity of a security breach. We'll consider this uh, incident closed. But who do you tell that you were involved in a UFO incident without them looking at you like you ain't wrapped too tight? Out of all of the evidence for the existence of UFOs, one extraordinary phenomenon continues to astonish and inspire me the appearance throughout the world of so-called crop circles. These elaborate designs appear mysteriously swirled into crops of grain in such a way that the stalks are bent over, yet remain alive. More than 5,000 of these patterns have appeared in over 30 countries, most of them in England. The media has led many people, including me at first, to write these crop patterns off as hoaxes, the nighttime work of a few pranksters. Of course, there have been faked versions, but those made by human hands are crude compared to the vast majority of these elegant creations. Could hoaxers have created all 5,000 of these patterns? Could a few people with ropes and boards have created something as complex and beautiful as this one? made in the dead of night in a driving rain and leaving no footprints in the soil? The electromagnetic field over the area where the crop's been laid down to create the image is often electrostatically charged. Some of these areas are littered with strange magnetic particles. One of the most amazing crop designs is not a circle, but a rectangle that seems to be a direct response to a message sent out into space in 1974. The message was a radio signal depicting our planet's location in our solar system and Earth's people in hopes that it might be received and interpreted by an extraterrestrial intelligence. 27 years later, in 2001, this crop design appeared in England along with what could be a self-portrait of the sender. This message matches the format of the NASA signal and describes a different solar system from ours, a picture of the sender, non-human DNA, and a microwave antenna they apparently used to communicate, rather than the radio antenna that we used. The antenna symbol had appeared a year earlier in exactly the same field right next to a working radio wave antenna, like the one NASA used to send out the original signal. NASA continues to officially deny extraterrestrial contact of any kind. And yet year after year, these spectacular creations appear. So what might these remarkable designs mean? Here are some two-dimensional versions that seem to be revealing the Taurus in 3D.
And here is the vector equilibrium. And the related pattern of 64 that we saw encoded in the arts of so many ancient cultures. When I saw the coherence between the crop circles and the ancient encodings, I thought regardless of whoever created them and wherever they're from, there must be an important purpose to these designs. They're so coherent. I've come to believe that the pattern of the torus and the vector equilibrium, especially in the form of the 64 tetrahedron crystal, is showing us how energy works in the universe so that we can learn to align with it. I believe that they're giving us a model for accessing energy in a clean, safe, and limitless way, and a new means of propulsion. What more important message could there be to get to us, and especially now, from their perspective, as we're beginning to extend our careless reach beyond our planet? I got further confirmation of this notion when I met Dr. Jack Kasher, a former professor of physics at the University of Nebraska, who has also researched UFO phenomena. Presenting at a Sequoia Symposium, Dr. Kasher showed a remarkable series of drawings by a woman named Lane Andrews, who claimed to have been invited onto an extraterrestrial spacecraft. I was startled to see her detailed sketches of the toroidal energy field that she said propelled the vehicle and protected the passengers. I subsequently interviewed James Gilliland. James has many hours of UFO footage from his ranch near Mount Adams in Washington State. He also claimed to have gone on board an alien spacecraft. What blew my mind was that he had never met Lane Andrews and had no knowledge of her experience Yet he described a phenomenon that was amazingly similar. Numerous ships with spinning rings of light. Could it simply be coincidental that James and Lane described the same Taurus dynamic and that both of these people have been harassed extensively by government and military agencies? To some, the idea of UFOs may sound crazy. And yet from another perspective, it is completely plausible. The Earth is about four and a half billion years old. That's 4,500 million years old. What if there's another planet that's almost exactly like us, almost exactly, 4,501 million years old? They're a million years ahead of us. And on a galactic scale, they're almost our twin brothers. So where are we going to be in a million years? We'll have solved all these problems, and there's another way, uh, whether it's wormholes or warping space there's got to be a way to generate energy so that you can pull it out of the vacuum and the fact that they're here shows us that they found a way this is a major uh, shock uh, to the human system that is uh, in process i understand why people in our generation people who aspire to positions of political leadership etc never dare go near that question because it's a worldview challenge is a fundamental worldview challenge. So here we are, a relatively immature species struggling with possible self-destruction. If aligning with the Taurus does hold the key to a new form of clean, safe energy access, imagine the implications. This could be the most important technology breakthrough of our times. So who wouldn't want to have an energy source that's unlimited and freely available? That turned out to be a key question, and that's what led me down the next rabbit hole. It turns out that scientists as far back as the early 1900s have been developing alternative ways to access electricity without combustion. 
Nikola Tesla believed he had tapped into what he called radiant energy. Many scientists believe he was accessing what's now called free energy. But before Tesla could finish the project, his financier, banker J.P. Morgan, who had a monopoly on the copper used for electrical lines, recognized how Tesla's invention could transmit electricity without wires. He then shut down Tesla's funding. Tesla's lab was burned down and he was ostracized, all for trying to implement his vision of unlimited energy for everyone. A modern day inventor, Adam Trombley, was inspired by Tesla's work and by the possibilities of the Taurus. Trombley built a dynamo, a direct current generator that accessed electrical power right out of the air. We were trying to demonstrate that by mimicking the magnetic field of a planet and rotating this device, we could actually create a dynamo that would work. And in fact, it did work and it does work. So when we contemplate nature, when we contemplate Jupiter, or we contemplate a dynamo like the Earth rotating in space, we're basically talking about a magnet which is rotating in space. And the lines of flux of the magnet are pouring down and through in this toroidal pattern of the magnetic field. It's also expanding and contracting. It's breathing. It's taking in the energy of space, literally, and transforming it. Right here in this toroid, we have enough energy to transform the entire Earth. And that's not just a theoretical statement, it's literally true. To contemplate the implications of this means that every single place on Earth suddenly has power. Every single person on Earth suddenly has power. We have universal abundance. Trombley had been invited to demonstrate one of his generators at the United Nations and the U.S. Senate. But these events were undermined by the first Bush administration. Then the device itself was taken in a government raid. Trombley's experience isn't unique. Almost every time I found an inventor with a promising new technology in the field of free energy, he told a similar story of suppression. Inventor John Bedini began working with Tesla's theories of radiant energy decades ago and has produced an assortment of battery charging devices that generate more energy than it takes to run them. He announced that he was going to start offering them at low cost. Soon after that, he was attacked in his lab and warned not to produce the devices. For his own safety, he had to let go of marketing free energy. These are all devices from labs I personally visited. Now. Now the quality of this footage is obviously poor and I'm not expecting this to convince you. My point is that being there with these inventors, accompanied by experts, and seeing these new energy devices in operation convinced me that the technology is real. And the implications of that to me are absolutely thrilling. Canadian John Hutchison not only created some free energy batteries, but also used Tesla's theories to counter gravity to make objects float. This could revolutionize the field of propulsion. His lab was raided and equipment was taken by police and government officials in 1978, 1989, and again in 2000. One of the scientists we were going to interview for this film was Dr. Eugene Malov, an engineer from MIT and Harvard, and editor of Infinite Energy magazine which covers both theoretical and technological developments in the new energy field. Dr. Mala was mysteriously beaten to death in 2004. If these inventors were all hoaxers and charlatans, I wondered why are they being suppressed so consistently and so brutally? I asked free energy inventor Adam Trombley why he thought this technology was being suppressed and if the UFO phenomenon was related. We've had major military people at great risk to themselves say, yes, these things are real. Why do you think the military industrial complex doesn't want that statement to be made? Because you start thinking about what kind of technology is behind that. 
That's the bottom line. The suppression of UFO phenomena is hand in hand with the suppression of so-called free energy. The energy is extracted from the fabric of the space around us, which means it cannot be metered. That is a direct threat to the single largest industry in the world, energy. It's good by ExxonMobil, good by oil, good by coal, good by linear transmission of electricity through power lines, all that gone. Unfortunately, it's someone's $200 trillion piggy bank. The proven oil and gas and coal reserves are worth north of $200 trillion. This information coming out would completely change geopolitical power more than anything since well in recorded human history. And it would happen in a generation. I started to examine the breakthrough solutions and much to my surprise, these concepts have been proven in hundreds of laboratories throughout the world and yet they have not really seen the light of day. Rather than smashing things together and trying to control the explosion, these new technologies rely on blending, of dancing with what naturally is. The common denominator of all the free energy devices I've seen is that they mimic, in one way or another, the torus energy shape. You don't have to believe in free energy technology to be concerned about the repression of ideas and inventions. I found myself thinking, what better way to justify our dependence on oil, coal, nuclear, and other dangerous and dirty technologies than to claim there are no better, cheaper alternatives? Well, you have seen this documentary that has quite some tremendous things, truly fantastic, marvelous, but, well, um, you have also perceived, I guess, that in no moment it talks about a God as creator, but it talks about the universe that creates and that it does everything and that we have a source of knowledge that is asleep and etc., etc., a parallelism to us being gods, in fact. Well, you can see that although it says things that are very surprising and it shows those structures of how it seems that the universe works and how also in, in fruits it appears, etc., etc., it is interesting to see how, I don't know if you've seen also in a bit, if you've noticed, how one could travel through this universe precisely through these created tunnels with all of this. Well, if we keep basically the functionality of what he has showed in this documentary, we are going to see also what a wormhole is. Um, here you have the whole explanation. I'm not going to read it to you because it is, it is quite extensive. But here you have a scheme of what a wormhole is that technically allows to travel through time. This is technically, of course. To prove this is quite more difficult, isn't it? But through theory, this could be like this. Um, there are, as you can see, different kinds of wormholes intra-universe, inter-universe, etc., etc., of different names, of different small modalities. Here you have a diagram also of a wormhole. You can see how it has the shape of a funnel on the top and a funnel on the bottom joined in the middle. He also said earlier that it can deform the universe. For what? Well, to generate that space to be able to cross much more quickly. Well, this is the whole explanation where you can see it at your homes. It is interesting to have make culture at least. You can even see m formulas here of how this all works in equations. And we are not going to stay only with all of this. You can see traveling at speeds higher than the speed of light. 
This part I am going to read to you. The impossibility of faster than light's relative speed applies only locally. Wormholes might allow effective superluminal faster than light's travel by ensuring that the speed of light is not exceeded locally at any time. While traveling through a wormhole, subluminal slower than light speeds are used. If two points are connected by a wormhole whose length is shorter than the distance between them outside the wormhole, the time taken to traverse it could be less than the time it would take a light beam to make the journey if it took a path through the space outside the wormhole. However, a light beam traveling through the same wormhole could beat the traveler. As an analogy, going around the side of a mountain to the opposite side at top speed can take longer than going under the mountain through a tunnel at a slower speed, since the drive is shorter. Subatomically, the existence of a quantum foam or a space-time foam is hypothesized. Advancing with the conjecture, the possibility of existence of wormholes in it is hypothesized, although if they existed, they would be highly unstable and could only be stabilized using enormous amounts of energy, for example with gigantic particle accelerators that can create a quark-gluon plasma. Does this ring a bell, this thing of particle accelerators? You know what's being done in Switzerland, right? Well, they are working for more things than it seems there. Here you have how the whole scheme would work with the wormhole, the Earth, tens of light years, and below, a distant star, and our universe with the roots that it would imply. And as you can see, a word appears, hyperspace. Does this ring a bell also? In Star Wars, when they suddenly burst forwards at high speed, they say coordinates, bam, hyperspace, zoom, and they shoot off with all the stars going past by them, zoom, at an incredible speed, right? Well, this is the way, theoretically, that this works. And now, we are going to see precisely more things of how I have titled it The Dark Side are those that talk in the esoteric world of all these things. Let's see in a web page, Dimensional Gates. As you can see, it quotes here the, the case of the Bermuda Triangle, like planes by crossing by there and boats, well, some of them disappear, others like the compasses, when they're near there, they go crazy, etc., etc. Well, here it gives some data of what the dimensional wormholes are, even being able to change not only of dimension, but also of time. To go on from a present time to one in the past. See here how, once more, how always everything is related, the dimensional doors, with what kind of things of which we have been talking about and denouncing as from here and of the satanic world also and so well accepted popularly with with the chakras etc etc and generally so well accepted that is why us when we hear about these things as christians we quickly reject them because we associate it with these kind of movements this maybe was our mistake look at this image also here. Later you will see an image very similar to this one. Keep this present in your minds. Even it says that it contains a lot of unknown energy that they normally open each certain time, these kind of tunnels in space. Normally they are found in some millennial ruins or geographic points like volcanoes or great lakes. They, those of the most paranormal world, to say it in some way, they situate these dimensional doors in certain concrete places. You know that in the documentary it has mentioned a lot, referring to matters of the sun, that they came from very far away, etc., etc. Well, there is always this kind of worship they say that they came with those ships from distant places, there is always the tendency to believe that all of this is for people or inhabitants of other planets come here. See in the movie Stargate that later was done a television series. You can see on this front page 
what is represented, a pyramid, of which we've talked about a lot here in these conferences, and on top, what would be a dimensional door. Maybe this movie is the one that most has worked in favor of these concepts, and the argument, here you can see how it works, and this one is an image of where it is shown of what would a dimensional door be in a certain place where you cross into it and wham, you go to another place. And you can say, well, this is, this is nonsense, right? You could probably say that this is stupid, some of you. Maybe others of you could say no, because maybe you're in, in this kind of esoteric world and could see these things as a reality. We will see if these if these things are nonsense or they are not. These would be the doors that take you from one place to another. These are captures from the movie. Now we are going to see precisely a video of dimensional doors in Mexico. However, various images exist that to this day do not have an answer and that some investigators think that they are dimensional doors. What do you think? Here we show you these images. The 3rd of October of 2005, the security cameras of the city of Ramos, east of the state of Coahuila in Mexico, captured some unexplicable images. Um, these cameras, we started the first stage with three cameras. They have a reach of up to 700 to 1,500 meters. They have a zoom that you can read at various hundred meters, a car license plate. They are situated in the neuralgic points of the city in such way that we can control approximately the 30% of the city's surface. Cameras like the ones that you have seen can cost about 350,000 Mexican pesos. With that zoom and without reach. In one of the calls made to us by the citizens about some objects that were seen in the sky, some lights, on Monday the 3rd of September, sorry, October, we saw that yes, indeed, there are some dots that shine in the sky. Close to 3 o'clock in the morning, reports were received of a very bright object that was found close to the city. Then the security guard uses a special security camera that is equipped with very sophisticated filters, captured the bright image, although it seemed to be energy creating a halo, a kind of dimensional door. In the first instance, some astronomers considered that it was the lens aberration before the presence of a very bright object, probably a planet like Mars, although this possibility was discarded little time afterwards since the rings were not concentric. These seem to move from one place to another, something fascinating, but it would not be the only occasion that this has happened. Three weeks later of what had occurred in Ramos, in Sussex, England, a witness that desires to stay anonymous captured a similar image above his own house. This one is very similar. Even with a comparison done, the phenomenon can be proved. Observe the images, they are unique in their type. But one image more would be obtained. Weeks afterwards, the 3rd of December, this image was taken. Clear images of a luminous ring, also in Sussex, Finally, in the same place, the 22nd of December of 2005, this image was taken. It would seem an eye in the sky. See for yourself. Mexico and England have been distinguished by the amount of sightings presented in the last years. Before, they were images of objects that presented the most various forms. Now, we find ourselves in the third millennium with something that we have heard but has not been possible to be recorded. Could these truly be dimensional doors? For now, we do not have the answer. But we will continue to investigate. Well, so you have seen in this video of dimensional doors in Mexico and other places, 
although we don't truly know if they are what they say they are, that is, dimensional doors, or if it is an effect of blue beam, of which we have talked about in the conferences, something generated by man, or really they are something similar to this. But be that as it may, it is interesting to see that precisely they have that circular form, as, is, as it is shown in the movies of Stargate, and we will see still something more, as is this other video of the Pyramid of Kukulkan. Earlier, I asked you to take a look at an image where a certain pyramid was shown. Well, you see now on this video what else happened. ¿Recuerda usted la fotografía del rayo en la pirámide de Cuculcán en Chichen Itza, tomada por Héctor Siliésar el 24 de junio del 2009 a las 2 de la tarde con 31 segundos? Esta fotografía ahora está realmente por todas partes en Internet. Se ha convertido en lo que algunos señalan es un aviso de lo que va a ocurrir en el 2012. Realmente no sabemos cuál es la razón por la que apareció este rayo. Pero sin duda alguna que es importante, sobre todo cuando vemos la explicación que están tratando de darle algunos llamados científicos, unos que dicen ser expertos en fotografías de Marte y dicen que este es un reflejo generado por un rayo atrás y la explicación que dan simplemente es inverosímil. Sin embargo, ha tomado nueva fuerza esta evidencia que nuevamente le presento aquí con Fernando Correa. En febrero del 2012 trascendió en la Internet la fotografía que dimos a conocer a nivel mundial desde el año 2010. Tercer Milenio fue el primer medio en investigarla por completo. Fue tomada con un iPhone y muestra un rayo de luz que sale directamente de la cúspide de la pirámide maya de Cuculcán en Chichen Itza, Yucatán, México. Obsérvela con toda atención. Una fotografía que logramos confirmar es una imagen legítima tomada el 24 de julio del 2009, cuya investigación y análisis realizados por expertos en imágenes digitales en Italia por Giuseppe Garofalo y en Monterrey, México, por Guillermo Anaya, nos permiten determinar que en la toma no existe truco alguno o falsificación, tal como aseguraron los autores de la fotografía, Héctor Siliazar y su esposa Glenda Hernández. De manera que efectivamente un pulso de luz sale exactamente de la cúspide de la pirámide de Cuculcán. Un fenómeno luminoso extraordinario que mostraría la energía de esta pirámide de los mayas. El investigador Jonathan Hill del Centro Espacial Marshall de la NASA sugiere que mientras cae el rayo el sensor de la cámara se satura. También Joe Thibodeau publicó imágenes tomadas por el mismo tipo de teléfonos en las que aparecen saturaciones de luz por la caída de un rayo. No obstante, en estas fotografías la saturación aparece como una franja que abarca toda la imagen. Observe y compare. Las imágenes saturadas son diferentes. Los rayos son muy intensos respecto a la foto del rayo en la pirámide de Chichen Itza, por lo que no resultan conclusivas. Y el misterio continúa, tal como lo señaló el investigador Whitley Strieber. Whitley, ¿cuál es tu opinión sobre el beam fotografiado en la Chichen Itza Pyramid? Bueno, he encontrado esto un fenómeno muy interesante, y como sabes, hemos hablado de esto, y estoy consciente del hecho de que nadie en realidad lo vio cuando sucedió. Also, that there are various things that can happen to cameras that can make strange streaks. But in this particular case, the streak starts exactly at the top of the pyramid, and there just isn't a technical explanation for that. There, they, they've, we have experts who work for our website, unknowncountry.com, as you know, but these explanations all come down to the same thing. The streak would have been across the entire frame of film. It wouldn't have stopped at the top of the pyramid, but it does. And frankly, I find it to be one of the most interesting photographs I've ever seen in my life. It could be that this pyramid is a working remnant from a past scientific civilization that we had on Earth, very different from the one we have now. And we might be able to learn a great deal from it if that proves to be the case. El misterio aún no está resuelto, más aún cuando existen estudios científicos de la energía que generan las pirámides. 
como esta investigación realizada por estudiosos de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, en la que determinaron que existen altos niveles de energía estática en la pirámide del Sol de Teotihuacán. De hecho, el artículo presentado en el 2008 en la Conferencia Internacional número 30 sobre los rayos cósmicos señala que la pirámide del Sol en Teotihuacán genera entre 0.5 y 1.5 teraelectron volts, lo que le daría sentido a la foto de Chichen Itza y a esta imagen que estamos investigando, en la que aparentemente sale energía de la pirámide de la Luna en Teotihuacán. Además, hay que considerar que en el Área 51 en los Estados Unidos, la Fuerza Aérea construyó una pirámide experimental de la cual muy poco se conoce. No obstante, demostraría el interés de los militares por el conocimiento verdadero de la energía de las pirámides. Acá Kukulcán en Chichen Itza tiene otras funciones o una tecnología que aún no conocemos. En futuras emisiones le presentaremos más sobre la energía de las pirámides, estructuras misteriosas que contienen secretos que la ciencia convencional aún no logra descifrar. As you've been able to see in this video, this light beam seems to emanate from the pyramid upwards. There were people saying that if this was another dimensional gate, we don't know it. It seems that this light beam did truly exist. But it is also being said, as, as you've seen in this documentary, if this light beam coming from the pyramid could have been generated upwards because of some kind of construction or something that could be there, that until today is unknown, right? Well, you know that the antediluvians or the pre-diluvians uh, were not idiots precisely. God knows if they really managed to build something like this. It's curious to see that it is precisely in the Pyramid of the Sun. And you've also seen a hypothetic one that was in the one of the Moon. As you know, these heavenly bodies, especially the Sun, were totally the symbol of the worship to Satan, to Lucifer, the light bearer, theoretically, before. Well, in any case, we are realizing that there could be something there. And we will see how really everything that we've been showing now can appear also in places like these. The Holy Bible. We are going to read a text now practically to finish the topic of today, which is found written in the book Acts of the Apostles in chapter 1 and verses 9 to 12. If we go a bit earlier, we remember that Jesus goes to his apostles, he tells them some things, he talks to them about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, etc., etc., and he ascends to heaven. We are going to read only these verses. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, angels, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. This text is quite more impressive when we know something that Ron Wyatt already mentioned and that now we are going to see and remember. But pay attention to the text that we are going to be analyzing in the course of the next conference, if it is God's will, following with this theme, with this topic, because we will see the biblical texts that talk to us about these doors in heaven, even the door to heaven, and you will see what we simply 
So, in a very symbolic way of speaking, of some doors simply in some walls of Jerusalem, of the celestial Jerusalem, yes, because exist, they do exist, but there is something more to all of this. It is interesting to stop in a moment where Christ ascends to the heavens, what happened, what took him out of their sight, out of the sight of the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, a cloud. Really, was it a cloud? Because when we read the text, we imagine ourselves a little cloud in the sky, like the ones we see every day. But was it truly a cloud? Or was it something that came from heaven and with which later he went away? Are we talking about UFOs? There would be a scandal if I just leave it here as it is. I'm not going to go into more detail, just tell you so that you realize that I'm not saying Christ is a Martian or anything like it. We're talking about the God, the Creator. But we must remember that this detail, that Christ is going to come back in the clouds, this we will analyze it also. And Ellen White also talks that he will come in a platform in which the redeemed of all the ages will mount on to go to heaven, passing through where? Through Orion. See what details we will continue seeing that will make us perceive the magnitude of things as we have never imagined. But that does not stay only in a knowledge that you say, ah, okay, so it's like this, and I imagined it the other way. But that also it has a, a very concrete function and very special because everything at the end is going to take us to one place, to one location, one word that you see here. Jerusalem. All of this we will see it at due time and offering quite some impressive details, I think. But anyway, before to finish, I would like you to see precisely the compilation of those quotes, pardon, of those images in which Ron Wyatt left embodied or someone filmed him when he was referring to the gate to heaven in a very specific place. Have you noticed the previous text that we have read? Where did this happen, the event of the apostles looking at the heavens while Jesus leaves? From the Mount called Olivet, known commonly as the Mount of Olives, which is near to Jerusalem, there, right next to it. We are going to see things that truly, I think, are going to surprise you as much as it surprised me while I was preparing this topic. Thank God that now we can show this to you and you will see once more that everything that Satan is moving in this world that is making so many people in this world fall into a deception that is based always or normally on something that is true. And then simply with a little twist, he diverts people completely from God. Well, without further ado, we are going to see the video of Ron Wyatt. You will see at the beginning of this video that there are some words that do not belong to the filming of Ron Wyatt, but we have put them on top as explanatory notes so that you can situate yourselves in the places or those places where Ron Wyatt is talking or is going to talk. And it will be useful to us also to start to comprehend the magnific importance of why Jerusalem is the key of everything since time immemorial in the history of mankind and until the very end and further on. You will see in the description of the letters that are going to appear now some places like Mount Moria or Golgotha, etc., Read, please carefully, with attention, what appears there and memorize it, because it will help us to locate ourselves perfectly with everything that we are going to see here and after in these conferences. Let's enter the video. The 
blood of these animals that represented Christ as our sin bearer was sprinkled. Now, 600 years before Christ was to be crucified, the Babylonian army was coming down from the north to destroy Jerusalem. And some godly men were informed by God to take that Ark of the Covenant and the other furnishings of the temple and hide them in a cave chamber in this cliff face that you just walked by, okay? The one that has the skull, the face of the skull in it. He had them hide it under there. Now, 600 years later, the Romans chose a spot directly above where the Ark of the Covenant was, and they cut out cross holes in the bedrock of this park not up on the hill where most of us have been taught that it occurred. But I would like to point out that this is Mount Moriah. Even this quarry that we are in over here is still Mount Moriah. This is the place where Christ died. Within a hundred yards of where you're sitting this minute. It's where that took place. And this sepulcher right here is the very one that he arose from. <laughs> this is the gateway to heaven. Jacob, when he had his dream, he was just a little north of here. And uh, his vision, and he said he saw angels ascending and descending. And he, he said, this is none but the gateway to heaven. And I assure you, that's what it is. We decided to clean out the garden tomb of a bunch of trash and stuff that had accumulated over the years. And if you want to see where Christ was buried, go look in the garden tomb, because that's where. And the crucifixion site is approximately 80 feet from the garden tomb. I won't tell you any more on that until we can show it to you on video. Jerusalem is situated on two mountains, Mount Zion on the west and Mount Moriah on the east. Moriah extends from the Temple Mount on the south end and continues beyond the city wall to the north. In ancient times, a dry moat was cut through this mountain to prevent invading armies from easily entering the city from the north. The northern part of the mountain, located outside of the city, was then used at some point in time as a quarry and where the mountain was cut away is very visible. Along the escarpment or cliff face which was formed when it was quarried is located the tomb. Also along this escarpment is the well-known skull face. And between the skull face and the tomb is the site Ron Wyatt pointed to in 1978 when he said that's Jeremiah's grotto and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. If you have perceived Ron Wyatt's words, you'll have realized that the point where he found himself in those moments, in the moment where all of this was filmed, he said clearly that he was in the area of the tomb, of the garden tomb. He describes that some meters further from there was the mount of the Golgotha, the skull, and that underneath, although here you can see it a bit separated, was where the Ark of the Covenant was found. And you could say, what does all of this have to do with what we're talking about? If we continued to enlarge the image, we would see, it would appear, you would, you've seen it in the filming, the area of the Temple of Jerusalem can be seen actually with the Al-Aqsa Mosque placed there. All of this area was 
known as the Mount Moria, where precisely Abraham had to sacrifice his son Isaac. You know that God did not allow this. It was a trial that he did to him simply so that he could realize what can signify for a father to give his son with which thing he should experiment the divinity that he was going to sense in those moments and also being innocent Christ having to die for the sins of all of us all of that already happened as a reflection or as a type of what would be further on years afterwards many many years afterwards the death of Christ in that same place all of it happened in the same place if you remember also Ron Wyatt talks about his encounter with Jesus precisely in that place while he was at the excavation place and he says in that encounter that Jesus when he has the dialogue with him that he says that he had come from South Africa and he was going to the New Jerusalem from there how is this how from there Ron said remember this that it was the gate to heaven these are not vulgar words these are very very important words if from there there is a place that goes directly to heaven now you will understand why the New Jerusalem is going to place and settle precisely in this place. Much more widely of what is the actual Jerusalem, of course. But the New Jerusalem that is going to descend from God is going to settle precisely there. And do you know why? Because this is the end, or the beginning, depending on how you're looking at it, of that tunnel to heaven. You've seen also that Jacob as Ron Wyatt said, in Bethel, which is right there, just some meters from there, he had the experience of that dream of the ladder on which the angels of God climbed up and down on. And he, Jacob, said that that was the gate of heaven. It was not in a figurative sense exclusively, it was also literal. In the next conference, if it is God's will, we are going to break down a whole series of biblical verses that is going to give us now, knowing these things, a completely different perspective and with a phenomenal power about the biblical text that until now we had not perceived. You know, Ron knew that here was the gate to heaven 30 years before us we have needed 30 years for God to be able to show us truly that there is truly a gate to heaven this does not mean that going there boom wow then you go to directly to another dimension to heaven no but we will see how that area truly has a great importance and it will once again you know the curious thing about all of this was that I had a conversation when I was precisely looking at all these topics, investigating them with much prayer with my brother and my partner also, the one that helps us to assemble this conference that you've seen here, and that was at the Museum of the Wyatt, I told them precisely that there was something else that the dimensional gates truly existed. Evidently, logically, their reaction was very surprising, right? They were surprised. Well, I thank them because they did not distrust me directly. But it is true. I'm not saying nothing about this to extol myself. Please do not understand this like that. But simply that God is showing us now an additional light so that we can come to understand things that have a transcendence very superior to what we would ever had imagined so that we could see the biblical text with a much much bigger strength and that all of this is wanting to tell us something and that 
all of this is going to help us, and this is the base of everything, to have arguments so as to tell the people that do believe in dimensional gates, but as people of other worlds, that come here with their UFOs as on vacation, to say some things and then they leave, or they shoot them down or whatever, that's truly this exists, but that no Martians come to visit us, if not other beings. And we will talk truly what happens with all of this. We have seen in the documentary first that the technology of the UFOs was being talked about. We will talk about this also. But you've seen once more, Satan says things that are based on the truth. In that documentary, they were showing how since the dawn of humanity, with those first civilizations, they had some knowledge, impressive knowledge, respect to it, this cosmic energy that they say or believe. Where did they get this from? Whose worshippers were they? Of Lucifer, of Satan. And now we can perceive once more that Satan continues copying and plagiarizing what he knows that there truly is, which are from God, and that he himself has lived. But he knows how to distort to the point where he will dupe, he will fool thousands or millions of people with deceptions. And that is how he is doing it. Now, we will have arguments, valid arguments, solid, to be able to take these people to the true knowledge, the authentic one, the one of God, not of Satan. Well, I would like to leave the conference here, finish, and refer you to next week, if it is God's will, in which we will do that analysis in detail, where I think you will be as impressed as I was. May God help us to understand all things, because the end is truly near. Until the next time, thank you.